This is probably one of the largest long case clocks you will ever see. This massive piece measures 9 feet 2 inches with an amazing quality to boot. The big clock is dated about the last few years of the last century in the 1980s. At the top of the arch, we have a strike silent and a chime island, so you can turn off everything. And I see it's retailed by Dutton and Son of Oldbury. The gilt numbers would have also been very nicely silvered. So originally, of course, this would have been very nicely silvered, and these gilt numbers would have shown up very well. Now, someone's obviously had a crack at uh, cleaning this, but this can be resilvered without any trouble at all. For a clock of this size, it only has four gongs with every excellent carvings on the oak case. So, what would do you think it would fetch at auction? Probably five or six thousand pounds as a bare minimum. And to the right customer who wanted a big clock for a very large, impressive house, I could well see somebody spending at least ten to twelve thousand pounds in a shop for it. So. Keep looking after. I know it's never going to go. It's Good. in the family. <laughs> it's too much to us. We have an art painting with great historic and sentimental value. The artist of this piece is named Johann Hendrik Weisenbrook. Well, this is an artist I've always liked, and I've known about him probably for about ten years because a number of works have appeared at auction. He was born in Rotterdam in 1860 and died in about 1942. One unique thing about it is the way the painting was made. I suppose 30 or 40 years before, the Dutch were painting in a more meticulous, more almost photographic style, almost emulating the, the 17th century. And the idea is the play on light. And you can see that beautifully here with the, the sort of sun coming in through the trees and, and on the back of the boy and on the pig's backs. So I think it's, it's a beautiful picture. According to the guest, it was inherited from her great-grandfather, who was a collector of paintings and antiques. The painting dates back to about the 1920s. Now the great question, of course, is what is it worth? Um, well, I think something like this, if it appeared at auction, would make between seven and ten thousand pounds. Um, That's all price, wonderful. which is a which is a lot of money. Wonderful. Take a look at this incredible album of different banknotes. This collection started due to a joke the guest made a couple of years ago on a TV show. One day I was doing a TV programme and they asked me what my hobby was. And as a joke, I just said, collecting money. It was a joke. <laughs> and then people started sending me banknotes. The Great elaborates more on how much he loves the designs and details on the banknotes. The fact that some banknotes employ the greatest artists of the day to decorate yeah. them and things like this. And they say something, I think, sometimes about the country. They certainly say something about the government, you know. You get some banknotes with the revolutionary fist and you get... An eye-catching piece in the collection is the Bernard. This was an operation that actually occurred during the Second World War. The Nazis basically came up with an idea that they were going to print and put into circulation fake white fivers to basically try and destabilize the economy. There's also a coin in the collection that was from a lady whose husband flew Emperor Haile Selassie. On the front of it is a profile of the emperor, while the back has a crest with the throne of Solomon. It's also made of 22 karat gold. The value of this item in auction would be... In today's market, ever-changing market, is about £750. Mm -hmm. The value of it as a medal with the story and the connection, something that's come from his hand, takes it over £1,000. Mm -hmm. I'm getting emotional. You said that so beautifully. But it's true. This piece dates back to about the 1900s. It's known as a opal necklace. It belonged to the guest's great auntie who loved antiques. Uh, it was my great auntie Kathleen. Uh, lived in Harrogate. She lived on the Stray in Harrogate, and she was just uh, somebody who collected antiques. Whenever yes. she had any spare change, she'd buy some antiques. My mother inherited it, and then uh, I've subsequently inherited, inherited it from my mother now. This necklace is adorned with opals. In the sunlight, they refract the white light into a spectrum due to the internal structure of the opal. Here's what the appraiser has to say about them. And mounted in gold. And just to fix the eye on this necklace when it's in wear, tiny diamonds just firing off in the half-light of the evening in which this is worn. It is an English piece retailed in Leeds and made in the Birmingham Jewelry Quarter. It's a wanted jewel and as such has an incredible value. I don't hesitate at all in telling you that this necklace is worth £8,000 today. Ooh. Very nice. Okay. Very nice. This is one collection you don't come across often. 
The guest narrates the story behind this magnificent collection. My father served with Captain Scott in Discovery, as it was then, SS Discovery, on her first voyage to uh, Antarctica and maiden voyage. Included in the collection is a book bound in sailcloth, which is a log of the time with Captain Scott on Discovery. We also have a lovely and rather sort of bad condition photograph of Discovery in the East India docks. Here we get an introduction to the expedition itself or his journal. To his journal, which is quite extensive. He includes a lot of sort of scraps that he's cut out from well, here and yes, there. Yes. And then here a very attractive little watercolor done by one of his shipmates. Discovery clearing the pack ice done in the winter of 1902. Yeah. Things like this are increasingly sought after and uh, of considerable value now. Now the other thing here is the Antarctic Medal with two bars for Discovery and Terra Nova. Now I believe that actually there are only 25 barred Antarctic medals of the Great Age polar medals. Finally, there is this glorious watercolor by Edward Wilson. Can you guess the value of these items? This, I think, probably we're looking in the region of about ten to twelve thousand pounds. Good heavens! The medal alone costs probably about eight to ten thousand, something of that order. And then the marvelous Wilson watercolor is valued for it's a Wilson watercolor, which I think probably might command about seven thousand pounds at auction, or something like that. Monetary, I wouldn't care less. Neither do the family. Historically. Yes. I'm glad to hear it. This item was gone from a local auction for 120 pounds. The guest acquired it from a local auction room. I bought it in a, a, lo a local auction rooms just a few weeks ago. What, from around here? Well, local to North Wales, yes. Hmm. This is called a soitier, more popularly known as sota. It would have been worn as a long necklace round right. the neck and the ends of it would literally extend down right the way to the waist. They were very popular for about 1895, particularly through to around about 1905. They're real pearls. Oh. So you've got a woven line, a, a sort of plaited, spiraled line of real pearls. In these caps, each of the lines is set in silver with tiny rose-cut diamonds. And then each of these terminals suspends at the bottom a series of rubies all set in gold. Alternating with little cubes, each set in tiny diamonds, and then suspended at the end of the last ruby is another tassel terminal with more diamonds in the cap. This incredible piece is valued at? Because I think that if one was selling this, it would probably make £3,000. Oh my goodness me. Mm. That's a lot of money. <laughs> we have a painting with a deep sentimental history for the guest. As far back as I can remember, it's hung on the wall of each one of the homes that I've lived in. It belonged to the guest parents. It belonged to my parents, yes. My father was an artist, a Yorkshire man, quite an avid traveler with his paint box. And I was given to understand that he actually met Fred Hall. The painting was made by Fred Hall. As a young man in Newland, he was a bit heavy-ended and pedantic. He was a great experimenter with paint. He loved to push paint around to see what it would do for him. This particular painting of this is just full of joy of painting. You'd call it springtime, wouldn't you? The freshness in the greens are the spring greens, yes. aren't they? Yes. The way he's captured the sunlight on the hedge, the roof, and the wall is so exceptional. And because it's a popular painting, it could do very well in auction. Well, I, I would say probably around sort of eight to twelve thousand pounds. Really? Oh my. <laughs> This is a piece of ceramic history known as the Toping Jack Plaque. The music is by Henry Purcell, who is a very well-known composer. The plaque has all the musical notes and lyrics from the song Toping Jack. So Toping yeah. Jack is all about a uh, cook-holded chap who's been drinking a lot. Typical theme of a Purcell catch like this. Passed down from her grandfather, who got it from his mother. Mm. And she was the daughter of a, a landlord of a pub in Bristol. This is what the appraiser has to say about this item. And we're talking about, I think, the second half of the 18th century with this plaque. The maker of the plaque is not known. However, it is believed to be a Liverpool Delve plaque. The value of this item is? It would make forty to £60,000. <laughs> this incredible drawing is an original by Henry Ryland, a person known as Jasmine. The owner got it from her brother who bought it. My brother was a print kind of book dealer 
and he'd bought it, I don't know where, I think possibly London. Henry Ryland is considered to be one of the major artists of the neoclassical revival. He was also an incredible artist in the medium of watercolour. This is what the appraiser has to say about this beauty. And what strikes you when you look at it is the level of meticulous detail. The drawing is dated back to the 19th century. When asked about the drawing, this is what the guest has to say. Yes, I do. I think the quality of the drawing and particularly her hair, I just think it's so intricate and I love the background. What do you think this piece costs? This could easily fetch in the region of £30,000. Oh, gosh, right. She's just gorgeous. Yes, thank you very much. This is a pair of American preachers that came from New England or the original people. Uh, Mr. Moody, Dwight Moody and Ira Sankey were preachers. They were the Billy Grahams of their day. And they came over to England in about 1873 and again in the 1880s. Now, I may interest you to know that Mr. Moody was the man with the words and Mr. Sankey was the man who did all the singing. It's interesting because there's a strong sort of preaching tradition in Wales. And I suspect that that's what would have appealed to a Welsh, um, reasonably well-off yeoman uh, who would have bought these figures. Well, they're flat backs, and not a great deal of effort usually goes into decorating the rear end. Very often they save all the colour. They don't bother colouring in the back. The guests got them seven years ago for £285. Currently, they're valued at... So I think you've paid a reasonably good price for them. I was going to put a value of somewhere between three and £450 on them. Oh, well, which isn't too bad, is which it? Isn't too bad. Take a good look at this rare tankard. It was passed down like a family heirloom to the guest. Um, well, it's my husband's grandmother's. If it's been passed on as a family heirloom. And other than that, I don't know anything at all. Well, it's made in 1767, has a maker's mark, I.K., for a chap called John King. Pretty open work, thumb piece, a very pretty scroll handle here, which is extremely nice, and with contemporary initials. There's a little bit of damage to the lid, but it's a nice drinking tankard. It's about two pints, but the guest only keeps it for show. Well, George III tankards are not absolutely the most amazing things. The value of this is? 15... Uh, 1800 pounds. <laughs> this is a vintage glass vase from the 20th century. The guest parent bought it and it has been in the family ever since. In the 1930s, my parents went to an estate sale in New Haven, Connecticut, and they bought it. And I know that they didn't pay much money for it because they didn't have any money. It's been in the family for over 60 years. This particular glass was made at Tiffany around 1914. Tiffany was owned and operated by Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Who was the son of Charles Tiffany. This particular glass is called aquamarine glass. It was produced for a very short period of time. The glass resembles seawater. And when they first made this, they put a lot of aquatic life in it. Later on, they added flowers to it. This piece is signed on the bottom. It says ELC Tiffany Fab with a number. At the time, they would sell these for between $200 and $250. And there were very few made. This piece of glass is worth between. Your piece of glass is worth between $30,000 and $40,000. <laughs> Pretty good. Take a look at this Omega Speed Master Watch. It has the mission logo, which is the Apollo Soyuz mission. After the mission, about 400 of them were manufactured in 1976. It comes with an original receipt as well. According to the guest, it belonged to his brother. He bought this watch unknown to us as a family. Unfortunately, he died later that year in a car crash. Here's what the appraiser has to say about the watch. From the collector's point of view, the pushers are fatter. Yeah. The case is rather different to accommodate the big pushers. The watch is a 100% original model. The collection is great with receipt, watch, and extracts from the archives. This watch is currently valued at? I think you're going to get a minimum of 80000 for it. <laughs> really? Have you heard of the Glastonbury chair before? Glastonbury is the place where Joseph of Arimathea brought Christianity. The chair has countless illustrations and books, but nothing like the real thing. There are restoration in the woodwork. The central tablet is original, but the wood left and right are replacements. There's lots of replacements, but it's expected of a chair of this age. Here's what the owner has to say. This is something we, we want people to see it. People recognize the Glastonbury chair. They're not allowed to sit in it, but they can no. see it. 
In the market today, it is valued at... This is, the, this is it. It could be worth £50,000. It could even be worth £100,000. This figure is a Roman treasure. The guest narrates how this piece came to be in his possession. I was just walking back to the car and got a signal. He initially thought it was a Roman statue until he cleaned it out. It's at least the first century. It's believed to be a knife handle. What they used to, um, wax tablets, they used to write on them, and then they used to heat the knife up. It's made of bronze and is a figure of Hercules. This is what the appraiser has to say about this piece. If you pick it up, because a, a wax spatula, like you say, would have a longer blade, much more sort of fits the blade of a scalpel to me. So was it a doctor's piece for childbirth? Value-wise, it costs about? Value-wise, five to eight hundred. Hmm? Nice. A guest brought a New Republic portfolio of five prints in a folder. The top one was the first print from the left side view of Edward Hopper. It is called Sentinels of North Creek. It was a guest's best print. She's familiar with the artist. And it's signed Edward Hopper underneath. Yes. The second print was by Kenneth Hayer Miller, who was an American artist and instructor. What is interesting about seeing these two prints together was that it strengthens the provenance and even more. Next was John Merriam, Ernest Haskell, and Peggy Bacon, an unusual female artist prints. The appraiser valued the prints. This is a more important print. It's called Promenade Deck. At auction, currently, you're probably looking about $500 to $700 okay. for it. A paperweight vase was brought to the show by this old woman who claimed the vase was owned by one of her paternal grandparents' employees who died while serving them. The vase was made by a company named Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company, which was owned by Louise Comfort Tiffany, an American first modern craftsman. Underneath the vase is the prefix R and a number indicating that the vase was made in 1899. The vase was a leaf and vine pattern with a paperweight effect due to being encased with different colors. Despite the crack on the vase, it's still worth three to $5,000 in today's market. Great. Looking at this chair, you would think it is like every other random cowboy chair. However, this guest brought this iconic chair to the show after it was passed down to her from her father, who acquired as part of the furniture he met in the house he bought in Gross Ill Island from Mickey Cochran. The chair has an aerodonk styled build and was made by Thomas Molesworth, the influential American furniture designer that was lauded for making this type of Western-influenced furniture with horns, hides, and natural wood. The significance and the perfect condition of this chair placed its value around $1,500 to $2,000. Oh, my goodness. So you've got a great thing from a great designer, and it's a, it's a wonderful piece of furniture. Wonderful. This guest brought the CA 1797 Chester County Marriage Chest Furniture that his mother gave to him in the mid-70s. He said that his mother got the furniture from someone in Phoenix and gave it to him because of the J-O-E-O -E -O inscription on the furniture. The distinctive thing about this piece was the combination of the Welsh, German, and Anglo furniture-making styles. The furniture piece was made with American black walnut wood. It was decorated with original brasses and graduated drawers, while the working mechanism consists of decoy panels with hidden drawers. With the beautiful design and the normal condition of the drawer, it has an estimated value of around twenty to $30,000. This woman brought a very rare golden Claire Falkenstein earring and hair ornaments into the show. She was an art collector herself and brought the hair ornament at an online auction for just $50, well, she bought the earrings at a church thrift shop for just 2 to $3. The interesting thing about the ornament and earrings was attributed to the maker Claire Falkenstein because she was known for sculpture making and very rarely used gold, making these pieces once-in-a-lifetime items. These very unusual pieces have dangling irons, golds, brass, and a signed full name of Claire Falkenstein. The estimated auction value of this ornament would be around five to $6,000, while well, the earrings should be worth between four to $5,000. These French porcelain vases this guest brought to the show exude everything royalty and beauty. The porcelain vase was made around 1860 in Le Mans, France. Looking closely at the vase, you will see excellent hand-painted flower designs that speak of the craftiness and details that went into the creation of such vases. The demand for this quality and scale is still high in today's market. The value of this pair of vases is estimated around $10,000. Right. This hand-carved walking stick is a treasured family heirloom passed down through generations. It was commissioned by a tramp passing through town who was looking for work. The family, Lord, suggested it was purchased for a mere 25 cents, a sum that wouldn't even cover the cost of the wood. The cane is believed to have been made by a Union veteran, possibly to commemorate the Battle of Gettysburg. 
What makes this walking stick unique is adorned with intricate carving symbolizing aspects of the Civil War, including a cannon, Abraham Lincoln's name, and insignia representing Union units from the Battle of Gettysburg. With carvings of notable figures like General Meade and Robert E. Lee, along with Pickett's name, it's a remarkable piece of history valued between three to $5,000. Wow, that'll make my son very happy. <laughs> This guest came to the show with a Rolex Prince wristwatch that he said belonged to his uncle who had died. Although he did not inherit it from his uncle, he stumbled upon it in his mother's house who had kept it after the death of his uncle. The Rolex watch was Eaton written on the face, which indicates that his uncle got it from the Eaton family when he was their employee at one of their stores. The watch was made in a very little variation. It has a high-grade 18 jeweled movement with an engraved Rolex and company sign indicating that this particular model was made in 1930 and was named Rolex Prince. The watch is worth between five to six thousand dollars in today's market. Oh my gosh, you're kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Oh my god. Yeah. Holy cow. A rocking chair was brought by the guest who had acquired it in Pennsylvania about five years ago. The fascinating piece was adorned with intricate figures. The appraiser noted the signature on the chair depicting it was a work of Salvatore Pagano from Naples in eighteen eighty four. The guest claimed it was from P.T. Barnum's estate. The chest featured characters from the Italian theater, including Parrot, Harley Quinn, and a mischief monkey representing the fantasy furniture movement in 19th century Italy. How much would the item be valued? I would say that this is probably a $15,000 chair. This woman came to the show with a porcelain cabaret coffee set that she said had been passed down from five or six generations. Originally, the coffee set was purchased by the father of her maiden aunt. The coffee set has the word France engraved at the bottom, indicating that it was manufactured in France from around the 1890s to 1910. This magnificent porcelain coffee set went through an expensive process of hand-painting designs and other gold detailing that adorned it. Also, the background of this set had several colored iridescent and vibrant rose pompadour colors. With the high-quality adornment and the vibrant color, the porcelain cabaret coffee set still commands a respectable auction value of around five to $7,000. Thank you. This antique brooch used as a necklace originally belonged to the owner's great-grandmother. It is a stunning example of filigree and granulation jewelry, typical of folk jewelry from the Mediterranean to Scandinavia. This unique piece dates back to around 1840. It's decorated with tiny granules of gold, giving it a textured look. Contrary to popular belief, it's not a muff chain, but a decorative clasp. Similar items are valued at a few hundred pounds. This piece is valued at 2,000 pounds, making it a truly remarkable find. Surprised? Yes. Good. Traditional rugs are cherished heirlooms that carry stories and history within their threads. Yet this antique Kierman rug transcends even that esteemed status. It was handed down to the guests from her grandmother who lived in Germany and acquired it in Europe in the 1920s or 30s. Originating from Persia, it's a lavar kerman, distinguished by its pictorial motif, a rare feature that sits apart from typical rugs. It depicts Shah Kamur, an early king of Iran, holding a ceremonial mace. This rug is not just an object of beauty, but a glimpse into ancient royalty. Its exquisite craftsmanship, boasting around 250 to 300 knots per square inch in vibrant colors derived from natural dyes, further elevate its allure. You'll notice that the red is a sort of burgundy or wine color. That is actually an insect dye. Despite minor condition issues, the restoration cost pales in comparison to its estimated value of no less than $12,000, making it a true treasure in both sentiment and worth. For a mere 12 pounds and 10 shillings, enormous fork out in 1946, this charming woman's mother acquired this exceptional game pie dish, which she was a Red Cross volunteer during World War II from an antique shop in England. Originally thought to be a minton casserole, but actually a George Jones Malaki game pie dish, the large Victorian popular dish of the 1870s exemplified several flawless characteristics. Its distinctive features, as identified by the appraiser, supported its George Jones and Company origin claims. There's also a very discreet mark here. There's a little impressed mark, which is barely visible, but that's actually the company mark of George Jones and Son. What might this wonderfully adorable dish be appraised at? With values ranging from eight to twelve thousand dollars, it's a great deal for the aesthetically pleasing dish. She would be really happy. I think she would she too. She would be really happy with that. When you look at this, you might think it's just a high school drawing. 
However, this guest graced the show with this magnificent calligraphic drawing that was given to him by his great aunt when he was about 16 years old. This calligraphic painting was drawn by professional drawing instructors. The impressive thing about this drawing was its rarity because it's hard to come by a calligraphic drawing of a cat and the other one, which is an eagle. It's not like the typical eagle we used to see. The cat calligraphic drawing would cost somewhere around three dollars to $4,000, while the eagle should be around $2,500 to $3,000. Well, at first glance, one might find themselves unsure of its purpose, but this is an Apache medicine pouch. Now, it's quite a history, the item in question. However, hails not from Wisconsin, but rather from Arizona, and is crafted by the Apache Indians. It is a particularly significant and sizable one of that. The appraiser estimates its value at around $3,500. We come across, surprisingly, a Rembrandt etching that this delighted old lady had acquired. Two etchings, one a stunning portrait of him, the other a depiction of Christ at Imas. It was evidence of his extraordinary skill at an early age, since these were designed in his 20s, around 1630 and 1634. The appraiser can't help but explain what makes this artist's work so exceptional. It's showing him sort of astonished. It's theatrical. And this is something that Rembrandt did again and again. It's not that he was conceited and he wanted to know, get his image out there as much right. as possible. He was interested in picturing emotions and moods, and that's exactly what's going on in this self-portrait. Acquired in Los Angeles in the mid to late 1950s by her father, what worth may these prints be appraised at? The Christ and Amos print appraised at $10,000 to $15,000. Well, his in-demand self-portrait appraised between forty dollars and $60,000. A shock to the guest. No way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, no and way. that's conservative. Really? This woman came to the show with a collection of Mickey Mouse pictures that Chuck McKimson jokingly drew for her back in the 90s when she was working at an animation art studio as a Disney collector. The guest recounts a good relationship between her and Chick McKimson and how he would write her a letter and do a little cartoon at the bottom. Chuck McKimson, also known as Charles McKimson, was a celebrated lead animator at Warner Brothers Studio who was celebrated for developing the Tasmanian Devil character, Speedy Gonzalez, and many others. The incredible thing about this archive is the bit of having the real Chuck McKimson work on paper, and the fact that it was a mix of Disney and the Warner Brothers characters together. The price of this small Christmas and Easter cards would auction for around three dollars to $500, with the larger watercolors estimated between $1,500 to $2,000. Wow. Wow. Well, I would never sell them because... This man brought this Hindenburg bowl and tray that he got from his grandmother. The bowl was originally owned by his sailor uncle that was stationed at Lakehurst, who gave them to the guest's grandmother. The interesting story about the bowl and tray was that the guest did not initially attach any value to the item until he saw someone bring another item that bore the same mark as that of the bowl in his possession to the antique roadshow. The mark on the bowl is from the company that operated the Hindenburg and Graf Zeppelin ships, meaning the bowl was gotten around 1937 after the Hindenburg airship crash. Also, the bowl was made of silver-plated copper and base metal with slight discoloration on the platters and underneath as a result of high temperatures, which proves its origin. The estimated price of the bowl at auction should be about three dollars to $5,000 apiece. The tea we drink constantly today at very little cost was once a luxury item. This old teapot was passed down the guest family for generations, and she intends to maintain status quo even after hearing its tempting value. The pot was made in the 18th century by a silversmith, Elias Pelletro. Although Elias wasn't very famous, his pieces were fine and remarkable. But in any event, a single teapot by Elias Pelletro like this is quite a significant piece. The teapot's value was $20,000. Probably. That's nice to know. <laughs> An appraiser showcased his musical talent on the show by playing a guest vintage mandolin. In 2003, a man came with a Gibson F4 mandolin, which he inherited from his father. The guest revealed that no one in the family ever developed an interest for music, and so the instrument never got played since it was acquired by his father at 15 years old. Because it was barely used, the mandolin was still in great quality. Uh -huh. They had craftsmen in the shop that did this all by hand. And the other thing that amazed me was how wonderful it sounded. This would definitely be worth at least, say, three to $4,000. All right. Terrific. Pretty good for sitting around the house, huh? Oh, yeah. Won't be sitting around the house much longer. 